Well, here it is. I'm back. And it's season four of the Bucket Seat Podcast. It's taken nearly a year to get back on track with the show, but I'm excited to be able to share the next 10 weeks of content with all of you, week by week, starting today. And I have a season full of exciting guests coming up. So some are new and some are return visits from wonderful people that I can now legitimately call friends. And it's amazing how a show I started as a place to blow off some steam and nerd out about cars has become one of the most gratifying things that I've done. Looking back at the past 59 episodes, I quickly realize how much I love doing this and how fulfilling it really is. And on top of that, people are listening. To all of you out there with me in your ear, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love getting your feedback on the show, the emails with guest suggestions or topical suggestions. It all helps me make decisions that benefit us all. So please do keep it up. And now getting back into the show and this episode specifically, I'm very excited to share with you the story of Peter Klute. Peter's the founder of Legendary Motor Car. And I've wanted to speak with him since the first day I started this show. In fact, I wanted to have a good excuse to speak with him long before the bucket seat existed. So I hope that you're settled in and you're ready to be taken for a journey down the path of LMC with the legend himself, Peter Clute. I'm your host, Trevor Byrne, and this is the Bucket Seat Podcast. Okay, so I don't often get out of my home studio recording these days, but when the opportunity arises, especially in this case, I certainly couldn't pass it up. And today on the show, I'm very lucky to have Mr. Peter Klute, um, and he's responsible for everything that is legendary motor car. And you've probably come across this in any search for immaculate restorations, outrageously tidy muscle cars, potential European collectibles, and of course, Dream Car Garage and legendary motor cars on Velocity and Business News Network. Yep. Right. So, Peter, I have to say that I'm honored to be speaking with you here. I'm right. also really excited to have a chance to finally come to your facility. I was saying earlier, I can't believe it's taken me this long to get here, but I'm here. And welcome to the show. Oh, I appreciate you having me on. That's awesome. So we're here in Halton Hills in Ontario, Canada, for all of those American listeners out there. Yes, we do have amazing cars. And I think this is one of those great examples of where they all are. They're here. <laughs> so... With so much going on and such a crazy facility here under your care, you know, you've got a huge staff, I'm sure, of master craftsmen and artisans working on all your projects. So it's kind of hard to find a place to start. But like I do with all of my guests, I like to start at the beginning. And so with that, you know, and not trying to be overwhelmed by this place, because I think it's easy to do so. I want to know what it was that got you into cars. What was it that inspired or hooked you? Probably like a lot of people, it was my brother, some neighbors, they all had Mustangs. So I'm a 15 year old kid and, you know, I see them cruising around and I wanted to help them. And, uh, so I said to my dad, I said, I really want to buy a car. I was 15 years old and, uh, bought a 71 Mach one that was wrapped around the telephone pole for 200 bucks. <laughs> no kidding. My dad was a welder. So he had equipment at home, which was, we were really fortunate. A lot of guys didn't have the ability to do anything, Yep. but he, you know, he had a welder, he had a compressor, he had all that sort of stuff and he would teach me how to do it. So literally kind of, you know, welded on a quarter panel or, you know, at that point it was really cobbled on a quarter panel and <laughs> painted it in the driveway and, you know, pissed off the neighbors because I painted their garage door while I was painting the car and painted nice. it. You know, the, the mist yeah. went across to the house. And <laughs> Don't worry about the overspray. Oh, ended up re-blacktopping <laughs> the driveway and repainting the neighbor's garage door. But Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. It was, it started out a nice sunny morning and, <laughs> and uh, the wind picked up halfway through the paint job and it was everywhere. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, hey, that could have been a really bad experience is the experience that turned you completely off of cars too. So I'm glad that it i'm glad that it yeah. didn't and so now that was um so that was first car that you owned was that sorry was that also did you purchase that it would it classify as per, being purchased with your own money well, well it was borrowed money but i, I owed right. it and my dad was always good in the in the sense of you know he helped out as much as he could but he also charged interest which was a good lesson that is for a kid yeah. and it, you know money isn't free and you know it was uh 
was a good way to start. That's a that is a great way to start. What was the what was the second car that you uh, that you ever bought yourself? Um, it would have been a '65 Mustang, and I turned it into a bit of a Hertz model clone, like a '66 Shelby clone. Oh, cool! Yeah, wow. And so, what was the time between the when you're 15 and then and getting into that Mustang? Um, not long. So, the when I was 15, I bought the Mach One. You know, fixed it up, painted it, sold it. I bought it for 200 bucks. I think I had 800 bucks in it and sold it for 2,400 bucks. And, hey, there you go. You know, in a six month period, I thought this is way better than delivering newspapers. <laughs> no kidding. So it was it was very clear early on that uh, that you got the bug. So now, I mean, clearly you were tinkering with cars at that point. And when you uh, when you got your Mustang, did it just continue from there on? Did it get crazier, or did you you know? Did it kind of pass for a while and later on in life it came back? No, it, it just kept getting crazier right away. So, uh, you know, as soon as I got my license, you want to go faster. And then you hung out at, you know, West End Finch was uh, the place to hang out. And, you know, we were doing some street racing and that and built a Boss 302 and had, you know, two 660s through the hood and put wheelie bars, built a set of wheelie <laughs> bars. And you know, <laughs> not that you're ever up on them, but just they look cool. Of course, and, yeah. Yeah, so it was a bit of a hot rod that uh, you know was a pretty quick car for the time. That's wild. I was, and yeah. you know what? It's in, it's it's probably important to know too. So were you born and raised in Toronto? Yeah, just outside in Etobicoke. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what was that cool car that everyone to ha- everyone had to have when you were in high school, or was it your car? Um, <laughs> it there was a bunch of cool cars. So usually they ended up being Mustangs. So we had a couple buddies that had. Uh, a couple of Mustang coupes. I had a fastback. There was another guy that had a um, a really quick LS6 Chevelle. Uh, there was a bunch of Corvettes that were really quick. Um, and, you know, everything up at where we used to drag race up at Weston and Finch, there was some, some pretty neat cars back then. That's amazing. Yeah. I, wish, uh, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall at that point. This is an interesting question, especially for you, uh, because I, I ask it to all of my guests and they're very different answers. And I'm very interested in yours, which is what's your daily driver? <laughs> <laughs> that can be what's ever closest to the door, but usually it's a pickup truck. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> nice. And then if you were out to, uh, you know, you had a, a, a free Sunday morning, it's a nice fall morning. You want to go out for a cruise. What's your go-to? Um, right now a four GT, an 06 four GT. <laughs> that is not an awful Sunday no, morning cruiser. It's a, it's a great car to go cruise in. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a cool looking car. It's not ostentatious. They're fast. They look great. And uh, I've always been a Ford guy. Uh, I mean, I like all cars, but you know, owning a GT 40 was kind of the, the top of the bucket list back in the day. Yeah. That's a yeah. pinnacle. I mean, sitting in your office here too, it's like, you know, it, especially the whole facility, it's a shrine. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And I mean, just looking, I wish anybody could see this, the downfall of a podcast, but just outside the doors. I mean, maybe you can tell it's us an, about that It's an that original car. GT40 lightweight, one of the original cars. It is so, crazy. Yeah. So anybody listening, watch, I'll post a photo of that on uh, on our Instagram channel, just so you can take a look at it. It is stunning. So, okay, well, why don't we get right into LMC then? And and um, again, for anyone listening, LMC is legendary motor cars. Cars, car. plural, car, yeah. legendary motor car. And so if someone were listening to the show and they had no clue what LMC is, how would you describe it to them? So what are you guys up to here in Halton Hills? So we'll do anything automotive. Um, and I, our biggest strength and probably our biggest weakness too is we like a real broad range of cars. So, you know, there is a Henley-bodied Roadster Rolls-Royce in the back to, you know, a brand new Zonda R to an Enzo. Uh, and everything in between. Our bread and butter is probably 60s muscle sports racing cars from that same era. Um, you know, those are the cars we really like. But what's happened now is cars from the 90s have been become really popular. Uh, you know, we have an F40 out there, a 92 F40. And, you know, all of the Ferrari stuff and the Porsche stuff has really come on strong. And everything today is 500 plus horsepower yeah where uh you know that was the big deal in the 60s if it made 400 horsepower you know four and a quarter horse or 450 horse or whatever that was a big deal now it's kind of commonplace and when i grew up the cars from the 70s were lacking horsepower they were lacking any sort of performance even the early 80s yeah um but now i mean every car is a really good car 
Yeah. And I mean, and the weight is dropping like crazy on all these things too. And the, I mean, talk about carbon and you've got that F40 sitting out there too. I mean, it's just, it's in everything that's happening. And I think it's probably indicative of the the customer base too, as you're seeing everybody's childhood dream cars starting to evolve. You're probably seeing that in some of your customers too. For sure. Um, okay. So, you know, maybe we can start then with, you know, how did LMC come to be? How did this all start for you? Well, like I said, I mean, I started working on cars when I was 15 and, you know, you'd fix the neighbor's car and make a couple bucks and then buy and sell a car. And, and, uh, early on it, it was evident that you could make money doing it if you bought and sold the right cars. So all through school, I kind of bought and sold cars. And then when I finished school, I thought, uh, you know, I don't want to go be a banker or work in a bank or mm-hmm. you know, do something like that. And I said, I'd give it a whirl for a year. And that first year, I think I bought and sold about 60 cars, hired wow. a guy, did a couple of neat restorations and, uh, and it took off. That's crazy. And that all, yeah. that was 1985? 1985. Yeah. Right after I graduated. That's yeah. so wild. Well, congratulations yeah. because yeah. it's clearly, uh, you know, all your hard work has paid off or so it appears. Well, it, it's, and it's actually a crew of guys. So my first employee is still my restoration manager today. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part. You got to have good, good people because you can't do it all. You have to have good craftsmen. You have to have good guys that understand cars. And then one of our biggest strengths too is we have really good relationships with different mark experts. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if I was looking at a Ferrari, I'd be calling uh, Marcel Massini. If I was looking at a Porsche, it'd be Jerry Pantis. If it was... You know, a Mopar it might be Galen. If it was a Corvette, it'd be Kevin. And d- just various guys that are, you know, a lot smarter than I am with each individual mark. Mm-hmm. And we can pick up the phone and say, hey, what do you think of this car? What do you know of this car? Send the guy pictures. And all of a sudden, we have the most knowledgeable guy on the planet for that mark helping us out, which that- is a huge huge benefit. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Yeah. And and would you say because um and correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of the way your business is structured, you have obviously a restoration business, but then you're also collecting for yourself and for the business here and you'll sell out of that collection as well occasionally? So sort of the restoration part of the business, even though there's 15 guys out back and we do a lot of work and you know there's I don't know 30,000 square feet of restoration shop. Um, but that really only is a small percentage of our business, maybe three or 4%. Um, so most of it is buying and selling. Right. And then kind of break that into two areas. One would be buying and selling, uh, the traditional model where you buy low, sell high and make the spread. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the second one is really investing in cars and saying, uh, we like this as a, a car that we see upside in or we see it's undervalued for whatever reason, and we'll buy it at market value today, and sometimes even more than market value to get the deal done, Mm -hmm. and then hold it. And hopefully we're right. And it's like picking stocks and you're saying, hey, this is undervalued compared to this, uh, and only time will tell. Right, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, unless a, unless a, a barn opens up and there's 15 of those F40s all sitting side by side, you're pretty sure on on just general volume of those vehicles in the market. So it's got to be a lot of math that you guys are doing too and speculation. Yeah, yeah. speculation and looking at history, um, you know, how values related to each other for different marks or different models. That's amazing. And then, you know, having gone through the tour of your facility too and the restoration side of it, it's so fascinating and just seeing literally how far you go, you go with these restorations. It is just that you're, you're literally right down to the frame and, you know, these rotisseries are phenomenal. Maybe for somebody listening that didn't understand the basic kind of process of a restoration, even though it be at a smaller, a, a small part of your business, the amount of work that must go into it is sure so huge. Yeah. So if you could maybe just help us to understand what would be, what's your process to go through for a restoration? So if it's a ground up restoration, whether it's a full frame or a unibody or, you know, a combination of the two, every nut and bolt will get stripped off the car. Wild. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the body will come off, sometimes the skin will come off, depending what, what sort of structure it is. Um, everything will get stripped and there's different processes. You can acid strip it, you can blast it, you can soda, you know, there's, there's a dozen different ways of getting the panel stripped and cleaned right down to the bare metal. Um, then everything gets primed in epoxy and then your body work happens, your, your metal work. And, uh, sometimes that'll be 
a simple repair. Sometimes it'll be building an entire body from scratch, you know, having to digitize something off a correct original one, build the buck, and then build the body. Wow. And you guys do all of that here? Yeah, all of that in-house. We got some really talented craftsmen. Uh, and then you go into the bodywork phase of making the car really straight, mm -hmm. uh, gapping the car, making sure the doors line up perfectly. And a lot of times you pre-assemble the car so you would, you know, put the chrome on, put the glass in, put all the weather strips on, make sure everything fits, rip it all apart again, do your final priming and, and wet sanding, painting the, the whole car. You sand and polish the paint to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and then every piece, so every component either gets out for chrome plating, some sort of anodizing, uh, some sort of phosphate, like all of the original finishes. Um, and then the, the smaller pieces, you know, some of them are painted, some of them are different colors. Um, you know, there's different shades of black. So a lot of research. Right. And go back to, you know, some factory photographs or photographs of really original cars mm. to, to again, get all our information from. And when we're doing a car that we're not as familiar with or don't have as big a library, we'll go to guys that are the mark experts mm -hmm. and say to them, hey, you know, can you help us out here? And a lot of those guys will share because we'll share our library and they'll share theirs. And, you know, just a lot of guys work together in the industry too. So it makes, makes it a little easier. That's nice that there's a, a shared kind of camaraderie between everybody and everybody has the similar goals and I'm sure you guys help each other out a lot. And now, and it, it sounded like that's, that's across the globe, these phone calls and these connections that you make, it's, this isn't something that just exists here in Toronto or in Canada. No, absolutely. Like a lot of the, a lot of our customers and a lot of our customers and, you know, experts are literally around the world. Yeah. How many, just out of curiosity, in terms of your customer base, what would yeah. you say Canada is as a percentage of your customers? Um, usually about probably 50% American, 25% Canadian, and then 25% around the world. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Actually, you know what, and this is, again, I know as, as a smaller part of the business, but it, it fascinates me in terms of some of the trades that you have and the, like the, the team that you have employed here, what are some of the trades that you see as they're, they're kind of starting to go away as they aren't necessarily, you know, these modern processes anymore that, that people are, are being trained in and going to school for. Um, what are some of the, like, you know, for lack of better terms, lost arts that, um, that still are required in a, in an industry like this? Right. Um, I guess one of them is panel beating, which, you know, has been around for as long as cars have been around. And in today's world of collision, everything just gets replaced, which, you know, is simple and fast and, and economical. So making parts is a bit of a lost art and finding good guys to do that. Um, kind of engineering and fabricating, we, we, because we race and it really helps with the cars we do, because a lot of the cars that we, you know, specialize in are sports racing cars from the fifties and sixties. Um, so because we race vintage cars, uh, we have a good idea on what works, what doesn't work. And from a fabricating point of view, the skill set's very much the same. Gotcha. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, body and paint's pretty, pretty similar to what you're using, doing today, just sort of an extreme version of it. And the mechanical end of it is a little bit different. And we struggle with that as far as getting people, um, you know, everybody is now into computers, plug and play. Uh, replace components as opposed to trying to repair components. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a bit of a challenge too, finding mechanics that are capable of fixing things as opposed to just replacing them. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine it's so specialized based on the mark that you have or you're, you're actually looking at in terms of that restoration too. Right. Yeah. So anybody who's listening out there, specialists are still in demand. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, in this business, you know, it's a broad question, but what do you find to be the most challenging part of it? That's a good question. Um, so from a restoration point of view, uh, parts are a big deal for the older cars. Um, you know, one finding them and that can be really time consuming. And if you're using sort of, you know, reproduction parts, if you can't find the original part and you try to always find the original part mm -hmm. is a lot of those pieces aren't as great as 
the original tooling. So you end up spending a lot of time fitting them and making them work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then when you find original parts, you have to restore them and make them work as well. So parts is a big deal uh, from the restoration point of view. From the car sales point of view is finding either great original cars, which are less and less every day, right? Yeah, or properly restored cars. And, you know, it's kind of like a lot of things in the world right now. There's a big spread between the best, you know, something that checks off all the boxes and all of the rest. And that gap is widening again. The guys right. that are, um, you know, spending the big dollars want the best, no excuses cars. Yeah, that's understandable. And I'm sure that when you get some of these these cars in, well, maybe they don't even make it as far as your doors, but once you peek behind the curtain and you see some of the restorations that have been done, it's like, you know, air quotes, restorations that have been done. I'm sure you find a, a bit of shoddy workmanship in behind everything uh, that sometimes can be hidden with some some a nice paint job and uh, and some great advertising. Do you run into that often? Is that still is it, I mean is that a prominent problem? Sure. I mean, there's there's a difference. A lot of people use the term you know ground up restoration or mm -hmm. concourse restoration, and mm -hmm. and um, it's a pretty loose term. And there's there's a huge spread between the quality one and the parts being used secondly. Mm. Um, and the difference between, you know, a top notch restoration that would be, you know, a national winner or a Pebble Beach winner or, a, you know, Mealy Island or one of the major concourses, mm -hmm. a top level restoration can be a half million bucks or more. Um, you know, some are a million dollars, depending how much fabricating is required. And, and the rest, you know, some guys say, Hey, I did a ground up restoration. I spent 50 grand on it. Well, <laughs> you probably didn't do it to the same level that, you know, some of these other cars have been done to. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And you're talking about some of the concourse and now, um, do you, uh, and I know, I mean, I can see the, the trophy shelf here behind me. Yeah. What's your favorite? Um, I, I, I'm a real, um, originality freak. So preservation class to me mm -hmm. is, is sort of the, the ultimate. And if you spend enough time and spend enough money, uh, you can restore anything to perfection or as close as you're going to get to it. But it's really hard to find great original cars and then massage them back to exactly the way they left the factory. Cause a lot of times, you know, they weren't just put in somebody's garage in a, you know, in a, hermetically sealed bubble and they come out perfect. A lot of times they have some imperfections or they're missing this or missing that mm -hmm. and bringing them back to where, you know, they're as close to original as, is sort of the pleasure for me. Yeah. And do you find, is that, you know, kind of regardless of the, the value of those vehicles though, do you find that that is, um, the preservation class is where you see the most value being kept in some of these very unique finds? Yes and no. So for, and we're finding that the preservation classes, um, if you, if you get the right guy, they'll pay the most for those cars. Cause there's a very few to, to pick from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but having said that, if you have two identical cars and one is a great original car and the other one is a, a top level restoration, nine out of the 10 buyers will buy that top level restoration before the original car. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is, is the cars, when they left the factory in the fifties and sixties, they weren't super straight. The paint wasn't really great. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, the cars didn't work as good as a super well sorted car today. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're, they're not as good as everybody remembered them, uh, in a lot of ways, but that's how they were. Yeah. So it's a piece of history. Yeah, no, it's true. You're preserving that history kind of each step of the way. I think what it looks like uh, at least from your collection here as well. Mm -hmm. Going back to the beginning of LMC for a minute again, what was the first finished project to leave LMC? Uh, that would have been a 68 KR convertible. Um, and we did it for a guy in Montreal. And it was one of those first deals where I you know, drove out to Montreal with a truck and trailer and um, the car was rough. It was really, really rough, but it was a triple black KR convertible. Oh, wow. And, um, and the guy wanted it done right. And, uh, I convinced him we could do it right, which was <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, and anyway, it, it won a lot of 
a lot of shows. Uh, it, it became our calling card that first year. Uh, we did another guy, another um, GT500 convertible kind of off the back of that first one for a guy in Tennessee, and that kind of opened my eyes up to the U.S. market. And um, again, that thing won everything, and we took it to another level compared to what people had done. Yep. And uh, it just opened the doors for you know a lot of different work in the U.S. Yeah. Now, do you, how important do you find the, the show circuit for, for you as a business and for the products that you're working on here? Um, it's important to go to auctions and shows. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, it shows your work. Um, secondly, the auction uh, part of the business, which we go to a lot of different auctions, really keep us in touch with what the market is doing, mm. which is really important. And that world has really sped up. I mean, 20... 25 years ago before the internet was really prevalent, you would go to an auction, say Barrett Jackson, because everybody knows that. Yep. Uh, we would go to the auction in January and we would see what the market was doing ahead of everybody else. And we could come back home and say, that car is now cheap compared to what we thought it was two months ago. Go back and buy that car. Mm. So we got knowledge ahead of other people by going to the auctions and seeing it. And then as, you know, speed vision and the internet kind of got rolling, that sped up. So when they started going, um, you know, on speed vision and it would air a little bit later, you'd have time to at least make a phone call, try and buy the car back home before they got it. <laughs> nice. And then that went from, you know, you'd make the phone call and say, hey, I'll take that car because you thought it was undervalued now to the guy saying, I just saw that on TV, you know, I'm not selling it anymore for that. Right. And now it's instantaneous. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. The values are just like, you know, you see a balloon happen over the course of a couple of months. Right. And, and the market is now, um, very much like that where you have one or two cars that set a pattern or a trend mm -hmm. and, um, and you get, I don't want to say bubbles by any means, but you see, you know, you see it really ramp up quickly and, and come back fairly quickly too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've I've been watching it fairly closely because I was interested, probably a bit more so about four years ago. Before my, I, I have two young kids, and uh, before that, I was really watching closely the air cooled Porsche market, and it just prime example took off. Yeah. It was crazy. Yep. Okay, so you talk about the auctions and and being at the auctions and the importance of that, and you're traveling to those. Now, also aside from and in, included with that kind of auction circuit, I mean, you guys must be going all over the world finding some of these cars as well. So what are some of the experiences that you've had while you're out traveling the world, um, finding some of these vehicles? You must have encountered some pretty crazy or, or wild stories. For sure. And and one we actually aired on the TV show, which mm -hmm. was a, an Aston Martin, a DB3S, which is a super rare sports racing Aston. And... Um, the guy had owned it for 25 years and he was a really interesting guy. He had, I think it was an old Packard or Cadillac building that was three or four stories and that was his home. Oh, wow. So he had the, uh, you know, the elevator for the cars and he had cars in his, on his main floor. He had his shop down in the basement. Um, he had cars up on the roof of the building. <laughs> that and, sounds like a dream. Man. Oh, it was, it was a really cool place and, was, and, was, and, and where was this was this in it was in oklahoma in oklahoma okay. yeah yeah and uh so ended up we ended up doing a deal with the guy in the middle of a fourth of july uh party that he had going on and <laughs> it was one of the weirdest deals where literally the guy has a fashion show going on i'm trying to negotiate you know a multi-million dollar deal with yeah. the guy <laughs> and you know and then it came down to um it came down to a game of ping pong because he had a pool table and a ping pong table. <laughs> Come on. And I suck at pool and we were 10 grand apart and we played for the last 10 grand. Uh, it's amazing. Now, yeah. do I dare ask who won that? I won that. All thing. right. I think nice. it was a little shot. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. He's like, wait a minute, we're going to go back to pool on yeah. this one. And so that was in Oklahoma. Do you guys, do you get over to Europe often? Are you searching for stuff over there as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this year I've spent a lot more time over there uh, we were over, we've been over there five times this year. And part of it is the vintage racing scene is really big. I mean, everybody's heard of Goodwood and mm -hmm. Silverstone mm -hmm. and Spa mm -hmm. and the cars that they get and the people that they get out there, um, are really, really incredible. So, uh, this year we've, we've made a real effort to get over there, 
just kind of immerse herself in that vintage racing culture, do some races, get to know some of the people, get to know some of the players over there that, uh, you know, broker the cars, that own the cars. Mm -hmm. And that world's a little different. They're more into quiet deals as opposed to the auction scene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it seems like a little bit more of a reserved, uh, I mean, depending on where you are in Europe. I know that even just through a few friends, knowing the the car culture when it comes to modifications, they're more about debadging everything than they are, you know, you get down into some of the southern states and they're like, let's throw every badge we can on these things. We want everybody to know what we have Sure. versus, yeah, the much more reserved take on it. So, you know, those are obviously you've had some fun times. You know, what are some of the, the low times? What are some of the realities of doing and working in this business for you as well? Um, sometimes how time consuming getting deals done can be. And, and literally sometimes it takes years. Um, wow. You know, patience, I guess is a virtue and, <laughs> and, uh, it's hard to kind of wait for the deals to happen. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of times is, is, um, the wild goose chases. You know, we went over to Europe to look at a really, uh, rare Ferrari and it, it ended up not being a real car. No kidding. Um, and it was something that was built years and years ago. And um, wow. So, so really doing your due diligence and really having to be on your game yeah. to make sure that you don't make a mistake. So what did that one end up being? If you can, if you can divulge what, what the well, details of that were. It was supposed to be the original frame from an old Formula One racing Ferrari. Okay. And uh, bottom line was, is, is I think that frame was built and cut in two and kind of made to look like that probably 35 years ago. Okay, wow. So it looked the part, yep. and there were a couple of telltale signs and and uh, that we finally figured out that it wasn't. And, you know, part of the thing too is sometimes it's not the guy that did the original, um, you know, frame fabrication. Sometimes th those, those things could have traded hands two or three times. And, you know, they, they, it was passed off to one guy as the real deal and the next guy believes it. And mm -hmm. so you're not always dealing with the guy that's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. It's a guy that paid a lot of money for something that thinks it's real. Right. He genuinely believes, believes that's it. an original. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. That must have been a, a shocking moment for yeah. him when he went, yeah. oh, come on. Don't tell anybody that it wasn't real. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in this whole process of, of, of finding a lot of these these vehicles, negotiating is clearly a very important part of it and not always over a ping pong game. But if somebody wanted a tip or two about negotiating, what are some of your, I mean, I don't want your secrets, obviously we, we won't reveal those, but what would you give as advice for someone who wanted to be able to leverage a deal uh, as well as they could looking for, uh, you know, a gem? There really is no secret to buying cars. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do first a traditional buy low, sell high, mm -hmm. which is our, you know, 90% of the cars we buy and sell. Yep. And then the idea of trying to invest in cars because they're two different animals. Mm -hmm. And our, our basic model for buy low, sell high is give the guy the same amount of money he's going to get if he takes it to a major auction. And once you kind of put it in those terms and say, listen, if, if you take it to an auction, and I don't care which one it is, they're roughly... 10% sale, 10% buy mm -hmm. premiums. Mm -hmm. So there's a 20% premium. So let's say the car hammers at $100,000. The buyer is going to pay 110. Mm -hmm. The seller is going to get 90. And our business model is basically, listen, you, we both agree that the car is worth 110 grand to the end user. You're going to net 90. I'm going to save you the expense of taking it there, the hotel. A lot of the auctions, if they're under, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars are no reserve. You run the risk of not getting two guys in the room to pay market. Yeah. So we're willing to kind of pay you what you're going to end up in your jeans with. Yeah. Ahead of time. And when you explain that logically to a guy that says, and, and we're going to make your life simple. You don't have to drag it there. You don't have to clean it. You don't have to sit with it. You don't have to rent the hotel room. Mm -hmm. We're going to pick it up at your door and be done with it. And a lot of the guys that are into multiple cars are really good cars they really don't want people coming to their houses. They really don't want the stress of the auction. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we always say, we're going to make your life simple. You know, you're going to get the money. Um, we're going to pick it up. 
You don't have to worry with some people. You don't have to worry about getting it running. You don't have to worry about cleaning it. You know, some of the cars that have sat. Yeah. It's, it's a convenience. Yeah, totally. That does sound like a pretty appealing part of the deal then. It is. So, so, and the people that say, no, you know, I want to get retail, retail, and they're not going to take it to the auction because they want to make the 20% and, uh, you know, they're going to try and retail it out of their driveway garage. Great. You know, it's another way to go. Um, I think a lot of those people end up struggling trying to do it. Where do they advertise it? You know, are they getting real buyers? And usually those people kind of get tired of that process pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, a, it's an exhausting process. Even a, a, a completely insignificant car that somebody's trying to sell out of their driveway today, I think is underestimated just how much time and tire kicking goes into it that you're like, God, I just, can somebody else just do this do for it. me? Sure. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. The second part of that is buying cars for an investment. And mm -hmm. the number one rule I say to people is buy what you like. You know, and if it, I don't have a crystal ball, nobody else has a crystal ball. Um, you know, we'll make some educated guesses. But if you ultimately buy what you like, your worst case scenario is you've got a really good car that you really like and you missed, you screwed up on your guess. Sure. You know, and if I screwed up on any of the guesses that are sitting out back, I can live with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I really like the cars. Yeah. But the way to get those cars bought is usually to have to pay market or even slightly above market because mm -hmm. the cars don't come up for sale as often. Um, and in order to pry them out of people's hands, you have to pay at least market. And in today's world, everybody knows what the cars are worth, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, uh, it's only super rare cars that you, you have fairly big swings on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's just so much access to information and precedents that have been set for those models that, sure. yeah, it's kind of full transparency, except for the really special stuff. I'm sure you the really special too. cars are sometimes, you know, cars that haven't traded in a number of years and the markets moved. Yep. They're harder to put a number on. You know, if you have no comparables for a car and, you know, it hasn't traded in four years, you know, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. 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 No, that's very understandable. Yeah. I meant to ask actually when we were talking about the first car that went from LMC, just to give uh, some perspective to the listeners, what was the, what's the last car that just that has gone out the door, you know, quote unquote, out the door from LMC recently? Well, I mean, that could be a mix from, uh, you know, an original 427 Cobra. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> to, you know, a 67 Corvette. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so a real range. I mean, in our best year, we sold uh, 440 cars. No kidding. 440 which, cars. Right. Which I wouldn't do again. We were trading two nickels for a dime with the last 100 plus cars. I see. Okay. And we're just trying to get to numbers. Gotcha. Um, so I think the right number for us is probably you know, 250 cars a year where it's manageable. Um, and you can focus on, you know, getting deals done that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And again, for anybody listening to, I highly encourage you to check out LMC's website. Um, you list most of your inventories listed on the, on the site previous and, and current as well. Um, a lot of it, not all of it by yeah. any means. And we, we always say to people, if you're looking for something specific, give us a call. Yeah. And even if we don't have it, we have a really big database yeah. of, uh, of people that have cars and our emailers are number one sales tool. I mean, we send that out to, I think almost 70,000 people a couple times a week. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's just jaw-dropping. I mean, you drool when you go on the site, and I've always done it, and you guys have a really great standard for all of the photography that you do for the cars, too, that just, it's it's kind of imprinted in my brain, um, that framing of all of your vehicles on the in the in in your inventory list, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I've always, uh, like I said, I've always been drooling over what you guys have been doing. Now, in terms of, you know, moving a bit away from the business of LMC, the automotive industry is clearly changing a lot right now. We talked about it a bit earlier. Things like, you know, autonomy and electrification are at the top of the list when it comes to just general topics um, that are happening. For for someone like yourself and for the business that you're running, I mean, what do you what's your opinion? What's your perspective on these changes and how do you see it impacting what's going on in the automotive industry right now? From a uh, where cars are heading in general is probably a lot different than how they impact what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, you know, I think it's great that electric cars, I mean, they're the first time we ever drove a Tesla was years ago on the TV show, mm -hmm. their, their Roadster. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, 
I got in the car and I didn't want it to be as good as it was or as quick as it was. It, was, <laughs> right. it wasn't that good, but yeah, it was, I feel it was the same really way. quick and it was linear and I'm going, holy cow, this thing you know, right. really, really goes. And, you know, um, a, a Tesla today, they're fast as hell. They really and are. They really are fast yeah. cars. Um, and so I think from that point of view, you can't argue with what they're capable of doing. Yep. And the autonomous cars, you can't argue with, I guess what people want today. And I don't think it's going to affect the collector car industry because people always say, you know, what's going to happen when people aren't really driving cars anymore. And what's happened now is the cars have really become art as opposed to just transportation, at least the collector cars. Yeah. I totally and, agree. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, there a prime example was when just recently for the first time, uh, Sotheby's had, a Schumacher Formula One car in their art sale and it was art designed in a wind tunnel. And I thought it was a, a fabulous marketing job by the guy that owned that car. And I kind of know a little bit of the background on that car. And literally it ended up bringing way more money as a piece of art than it brought as a, as a car, as a race car with history. No kidding. It did. It, it brought probably almost double the money. Wow. And then you see some of these cars, you know, that are pulled out of the bottom of the lake and the, you know, the 356 Porsche that just sold at the um, Sotheby sale, you know, that needed everything. And it was a rusty old car. And I had two customers that actually kind of thought about it for their museum to use it as a, you know, juxtaposition to a great restored car. Oh yeah. Hey, that's a cool like idea. Yeah. A I like piece that. of art. Yeah. Wow. You know, and we see it today with we're doing a pickup truck for a guy and he bought this old rusty truck, but it's got what he deems and it is cool. It's, it's got real patina, you mm -hmm. know, surface mm -hmm. rust here, yep. and dent and ding here. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's spending a ton of money to make it super usable, drivable, spectacular interior, but he's using it up at his cottage and he just wants it to look like a beat up old pickup truck. That's which awesome. Is art. Yeah. I love that too. It reminds me a lot. I, I'm sure you've probably run across him too, but I, it, Another, uh, a, a builder that I've always kind of looked at with a lot of interest is Jonathan Ward and the whole icon four by four stuff that he's doing out in California is just yep. phenomenal. And he's got the, the derelicts, which sound, which sound like customers that like a very similar thing. That's just give me all the patina, but I want a full resto mod under the, you know, right. under the skin. Yep. I completely agree with you on the, on the, the notion of this moving into, especially from the collectible side as part of art. I mean, this is, it's art and history. And I think that combination is never going to go away. And the rarity of them is only going to continue driving the collectability and the value of them. So just from an economic term, I, I think that, yeah, that, that won't ever go away. The driving side I'm okay with I'm okay with autonomous cars taking the most direct route to A to B because it's going to leave great open driving roads for the rest of us who love to do it. And I think that very much in the way of, you know, riding clubs, we're going to move to everybody's going to run their cars on racetracks as they do now, but it'll just become more frequent because it's really going to be the place that we can go and who knows, it may be the only place we can buy fuel someday is at a racetrack. Well, and I agree with, and that's one of the reasons that we do more and more track stuff and more and more race events. Um, it's a place that you can really use the car. Um, it's a place that you can do it safely Yeah, and you can't even begin to drive any of these cars to what they're capable of on the, on the streets. And it's going to be the same idea as, you know, people used to ride horses for transportation. Well, now they ride it for pleasure, yeah. polo, you know, whatever horse races. And I think cars, if it ever gets to the point where cars are totally autonomous, then, um, I can see there are always being racetracks, always being events, no different than, you know, horses will be around, you know, a thousand years from now in some sort of sporting event. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm always kind of looking for what is that signal? What's the signal for change that's happening? And that is certainly doing it. And I think, you know, your customers and the people that I like talking to about automotive and cars are, are similar in the sense that we have some, there's some passion, there's some enthusiasm for that. Whereas the, uh, those who really want an autonomous car, you know, they're, they want, they want an appliance. They want, you know, transportation from A to B and the experience uh, of the car and like this visceral feeling and the smells and the sounds and everything that you get, you can feel it in your butt when you get into the seat and you're rumbling down the road. It's just not of interest to them. And that's okay. Cause I think that they can take whatever method of transport that they want. Sure. There's always going to be that kind of sweet spot and pocket for us. 
And in speaking with um, Lawrence Yap from FAF just recently too, he said that um, you know even out at CTMP at Mosport, uh, it is it is continually becoming more and more booked and busy on a regular basis, um, and that manufacturers are having a hard time booking in long enough in advance. And um, it's just a good sign, I think, that the that the tracks are becoming more and more busy, meaning that more people are obviously taking it to a safe place, but also that there's a lot of interest that's happening. And uh, kind of on that note, what do you see in terms of your customer base? And you know, are you seeing? Are you seeing, I say youth, youth can mean a whole variety of age ranges, but you know, how do you attract and how are you, how are you positioning yourself to that kind of demographic, obviously important for the future of the business? What do you guys do and what do you guys stay involved in that would kind of help that? We get that a lot where people say, you know, cars from the sixties, are there going to be buyers? You know, the people that are now, you know, the boomers, which are, our, our, you know, our main customer, uh, what happens when they move out of the market? And what happens to those values of those cars? And, you know, my argument with that is if it's a great car that's, you know, great looking, super rare, and has history, they will always be uh, wanted by youth yeah. or, or, you know, proceed. And that, that term youth really expands <laughs> as you get older. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But, uh, you know, prime example this year is the Duesenberg that sold at Gooding, you know, with an estimate of 10 million sold for 22 million. And that car, anybody that remembers that car new is dead. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't hold true, but it's an exceptional car. It's a great car. And if you look at the 8C Alphas and you look at the W196s or any of the great cars from those years, technically there should be no buyers left. But those are, you know, tens of millions of dollars of those cars. Those are some of the most expensive cars in the world. And they're cars that, you know, if you went by sort of that theory, uh, there would be no buyers for it. Right. So it, it's really turned into art and it's not about an age anymore. It's about what was a significant car, what had significant impact uh, both in the day and what has significant history. And that's why with, you know, guys going to the track, we're focusing a lot on, race cars because not only are the cars beautiful and you know they have street versions most of the time mm -hmm. but they have another um you know they have a different type of history than just this is what it did on the street you know the difference between a lamar winning car and a car that finished fifth at lamar can be double the price it's you know? so crazy yeah <laughs> okay so 2019 um we're nearly there is there anything that LMC has kind of in the hopper for the upcoming year that you could share with us or anything to look forward to watch out for? I guess that the biggest, you know, car that we're working on right now is a prototype 427 Cobra. Um, that was the team car. It was the house car. It was the cheater car. Um, you know, it's a really, really special car. It's a one-off car that you know, was designed to whoop all the Grand Sports and the <laughs> GTOs and, yeah. you know, every other manufacturer. Uh, it was de designed to beat them all. So um, it's just a one-off car that's really special that we should have finished by 2019. I love it. Well, yeah. I will, and and it, what's the best place? I mean, are you, will, will that be part of your collection or do you think that'll go up uh, at auction? No, that, that won't get sold. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so if you want to see it, you're going to have to come here, uh, book your book your tickets now. But, well, that's it. You know what? We're going to end there. And Peter, thank you so much. I can't, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you having me here. Such a phenomenal facility. And, and I really do encourage everybody listening to, uh, to come on by. You can, you can walk through and see some of these phenomenal vehicles here at the facility. It's a recommended donation to make your yeah, way through. It's and, just an honesty box. Yeah. All the money goes to charity, local uh, charities. That's so, phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, Halton Hills in, in Ontario, just uh, what, about 40 minutes outside of Toronto at most. Um, and you can come on by here and check everything out. And then, Peter, where can we find you on Facebook or Instagram and uh, kind of web web um, presence? Web presence is the best. And then you can link from there to Facebook. Cool. And it's, it's just legendarymotorcar.com. Love it. Love it. Well, that's it. For everyone listening, please do rate, review, and subscribe the show if you like it. You can find me all over the web at The Bucket Seat on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And keep emailing me all of your great feedback and episode suggestions. I really do appreciate it. Um, we've had lots of great support recently. And uh, thanks, Peter. Take care. Oh, wait, wait. It's me again, everyone. 
Before you move on to your next podcast binge today, I wanted to encourage you to listen to something called the Double Clutch Podcast. It's hosted by Addy and Jerry of DoubleClutch.ca Magazine, and it's a great way to get up to speed on what's happening in the product world of automotive. They have a ridiculous circuit of new cars they review on their site and their podcast. And if you have an interest in honest and humorous banter about new cars, make your way over to the Apple podcast and search for Double Clutch CA. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Also, if you want to get yourself into some incredibly badass auto-inspired footwear, check out Stripe Design for the best socks I've ever worn. They're the world's first high-performance driving sock with color and graphics inspired by the art, community, and heritage of motorsport. They're made in the USA and crafted utilizing the finest high-performance recycled fiber yarns. And like the machines that inspire us, their socks are designed with function first. They're durable, thin and light, breathable, and supportive with just a touch of compression to keep your feet performing at their best. They're rich in saturated color and the fine detail they capture, the essence of motorsport that you can wear every day. So go and check them out at stripedesign.com. That's S-T-R-I-I-P-E-D-E-S-I-G-N.com. I really do vouch for these guys. Phenomenal socks. They look amazing and you will not be disappointed. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Thank you.